This is the hour of the time, and I'm William Cooper. Last night, ladies and gentlemen, we were supposed to have a caller at the beginning of the hour, and I was having some equipment problems here, and if he called, I wasn't aware of it. So I'd like to ask him to call again. Chris, if you're out there listening, call again uh, tonight, right now. I'd like for everyone else to stay off the line, because if I pick it up and somebody else is on there, I'm just going to hang up on you. So, Chris Johnson, if you're out there listening, please call right now, 520-333-4578, and we'll do what we were supposed to do last night, I hope. Folks, in hooking up this new equipment, I'm looking at buttons and knobs and switches and uh, pots and... uh, uh, faders and cross faders and uh, frequency adjusters and I don't even know what half of them are. So, uh, I'm trying my best to make it all work. And uh, I hope that it does. If it doesn't, then uh, I'll have to bring in some expert. We have troops going to Bosnia. We were told that there were going to be 20,000. The truth is it's going to be a lot more than that. And the support personnel are going to be at least four to one. It takes four people to support one combat soldier. So you're looking at an awful lot of people, ladies and gentlemen, having to do with this Bosnia thing. And they have known that they were going for a long time because we have been getting dispatches and information from military personnel, medical people, went a long time ago. Long time ago. Long before the president ever said he was going to send anybody. The Pentagon has ordered the gruesome tools that go along with disposing of dead bodies. And so, they are expecting dead bodies. I expect dead bodies. Lots of them. Dead Americans. I'll tell you something, folks. In order to have their new world order, because Americans are not going to accept it, Americans are not going to give up their guns, the militia movement has scared them out of their wits, this broadcast has peeled their underwear off, they're standing naked in the sunlight, and, uh, there's only one way they're going to have their their new world order. And that is to bring about some kind of terrible disaster that will make people get down on their knees and beg for the end of nation states, for the end of wars, and accept whatever controls are necessary to bring that about. In my book, I outlined some of the possibilities. One of them is to detonate an atomic weapon in the United States in a major city. Boy, that would get the sheeple going, wouldn't it? They'd be crying and begging in a second. And, without knowing the reason for it, they would be justified in their minds for doing it. And they would give up any liberties, any freedoms, in order to get the security that they think such a thing would bring them. Hello, Chris? Well, I thought we had uh, Chris on the line. Chris, if you're out there, 
I hope that you will uh, call in, like right now, so that uh, we can do what we were going to do last night and keep trying. If I'm screwing up here and if I'm cutting you off or something, keep trying. I'll get the hang of this. But I'm looking at, uh, let me tell you what I'm looking at here. I'm looking at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten rows. And each row has 18 switches, uh, knobs, buttons, levers, faders, volume controls. <laughs> So, if you multiply 10 times 18, you get 180 knobs and buttons and things I'm looking at here that I don't even know anything about. Don't know what to do with them. Chris, if you're out there, please call. Maybe this is Chris. Good evening. Yes, this is Chris Johnson calling. Hi, Chris. I'm sorry about last night. I've got a whole bunch of new equipment here, and I don't know what I'm doing. That's fine. I, I understood that something uh, must have gone wrong. Well, I did. I tried to pick you up a couple of times. I know you were ringing, and I couldn't get you no matter what I did. How many times did I cut you off? Oh, it doesn't matter. No problem. <laughs> well, it matters to me. I've got to, I've got to learn how to do this stuff. Tell I just wanted to, uh, to uh, share with you some experiences that I've had uh, within the last six weeks. Uh, I just returned from Europe uh, not long ago, and... Uh, do you have a moment uh, for me to share some uh, 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 very unusual experiences with you? I certainly do. In fact, I've been looking forward to it, and I think the listening audience uh, uh, will be happy that you uh, are doing so once they hear what it is that you're going to tell them. Please, uh, start at the beginning and go right straight through, Chris. Well, to give some uh, uh, preliminary information, uh, <clears throat> I'm a geologist by profession, and uh, I uh, worked in the minerals industry, and in 1992, I uh, was working for Newmont Gold Corporation in Central America, specifically uh, within the nation of Costa Rica. And uh, we were working uh, on several gold properties there, and um, uh, we ran into some difficulty uh, in our exploration program, apparently, uh, some of the things that we that were necessary uh, for us to accomplish uh, were not uh, in a, uh, approval of the uh, Costa Rican government, and I respected that. They have their own sovereign nation and their laws, uh, and it prohibited us, of course, from proceeding with our project. I called uh, my senior geologist uh, in the United States, expressed that we had um, a deadlock in our exploration program, and he flew down to look things over and expressed to me that it really would be no problem. <clears throat> he called to a gentleman in England by the name of uh, Sir, uh, Sir James Goldsmith, some refer to him as Jimmy. Uh, I was to refer to him as Lord, Sir Lord Goldsmith. Uh, and he was the uh, principal shareholder of Newmont Corporation which is one of the largest gold mining companies in the world. And uh, after a few moments of discussion, my senior geologist with Mr. Goldsmith, uh, it was uh, uh, expressed that there would be no problems with the hitches in our exploration. The next morning, the federales of the Costa Rican government expressed that we could proceed with our exploration uh, and that there were no problems. Uh, why do I share the story? I thought it was so unusual that this man, Mr. Goldsmith, Sir Goldsmith, I should say, uh, was so powerful in his ability to call the shots of a sovereign nation and its laws concerning natural resources that it was a very unusual thing for me. Well, at, uh, at any rate, I had forgotten about that for quite a while until... I had this experience in Europe. Uh, I had gone to Europe for an, a, a, a several months stay doing research there. And on Halloween day, I was in London, England, 31st of October, uh, just a little over six weeks ago. And um, I uh, was uh, down along the Thames River, and I had wanted to search for the old ancient enclaves of the Knights Templars there in London, England. 
and I was having a difficult time finding it, seeing that London is quite a circuitous place to get around the old city there. And uh, there was a group of British broadcast reporters uh, covering a story along the street there, and I stopped and asked one of them uh, where I might find the, uh, the enclave of the old Knights Templars. And uh, one of the gentlemen expressed that um, there would be no problem in finding it if I would just follow uh, the Freemasons uh, from the lodge, that they would be able to show me where it would be because they were having a very large meeting at the old temple church. Well, I didn't fully understand what the old temple church was, so I went on up to the lodge where they had directed me. And uh, as I approached... Uh, the lodge is, is another uh, important uh, piece of information I should give you. Here in the United States, prior to go, uh, some weeks before going to Europe, um, I had been in discussion with some good people here in the local community that I live uh, in Idaho, and uh, we were discussing the founding fathers of this uh, country, and they expressed, well, did you know that many of the founding fathers were members of the Freemasons? Well, I expressed that that was an interesting concept, and subsequent to uh, our visit, they expressed that they were members of the local lodge and uh, wanted to know that if, if I was interested, that they would be able to provide me more information about the Freemasons. Well, I thought that was quite a quirk, and uh, had never taken much thought about such a, an affiliation. And uh, at any rate, uh, um, <clears throat> Uh, in England, I thought, well, gee, here I'm at this Grand Lodge. I might just uh, uh, take an opportunity to go in and see what these people have to say about the organization. Are you with me? I'm here, Chris. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I hope this isn't a monologue. At any rate, um, uh, uh, at this time, uh, I went up to the front uh, doors of the, uh, uh, the lodge, and there were quite a few individuals quite immaculately dressed pouring out and going to some major meeting as BBC reporters had, had indicated. Um, I expressed that I had come and wondered if it was possible for me to get some information on this organization, that I had been uh, uh, um, in contact with some gentlemen in the United States who had expressed that I might be interested in learning more about the Masons. They expressed that if I would go around to the side of the Grand Lodge there in, in England, by the way, this is on uh, Great Queen Street at the corner of Great Queen Street and Wild Street, the, the, uh, uh, the Freemasons Hall there uh, in London. And they directed me around to the side of the building, and there were some very gracious people who had me come in and uh, asked me what I desired, and I expressed that I was wanting to know more about the order that I had uh, had some friends in the United States that had expressed that they were Masons and and uh, had taught, uh, expressed that maybe I had, might, might want to learn more about the Masons. So uh, they said, please come in, and uh, uh, they directed me down a, a hallway. It was It's quite an opulent building, uh, and uh, as they took me down through several hallways with beautiful tapestries attached to the walls. I was quite intrigued by the very strange symbolism uh, uh, woven into the tapestries. Um, uh, 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 the skull and crossbones symbol, uh, uh, ghoulish looking figures within coffins, and uh, uh, Egyptian religious uh, symbols uh, uh, woven into the fabric. It was most unusual. Uh, by the way, uh, at this time, my, um, and, uh, these, these gentlemen uh, ushered me down to what is referred to as the old archives within the lodge, uh, where I would be able to ask questions of uh, somebody. Uh, I asked the gentleman what was going on uh, that was so important uh, this day. And uh, one of the gentlemen answered to me, he said that the high grand masters were having a a meeting on this important day down at the old ancient temple church near the banks of the Thames. And what did that turn out to be? That turned out to be the old uh, uh, enclaves of the Knights Templars themselves. 
it is a it's a further interest as they sat me down at the archives and they went to uh, obtain an old individual by the name of Matthew Scott Scholar, uh, 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 the assistant curator uh, there at the lodge. Uh, uh, um, I was listening to uh, some gentlemen uh, in in conversation uh, concerning some of the scholarly studies out of the old archives in the lodge, and uh, lo and behold, uh, their key. Uh, um, point of discussion was in concerning the Templars, uh, their predecessors, and they were discussing uh, ancient banking procedures in medieval Europe. I thought that was so interesting that here on this day that they were holding their Grand Master's meeting in the old ancient temple church and that the scholars within the archives were so concerned about the Templars and referred to them as predecessors. I thought that was most intriguing. It, to, to then make a long story short, um, I had the chance of meeting a very fine, uh, uh, gracious person, a very kindly person, uh, 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 Mr. Matthew Scholar, assistant curator of the Temple Archives, and uh, I was able to ask him questions expressing that I had been interested uh, in learning more about the Freemasons and uh, that I uh, had actually not been asked to join, but had been uh, told by friends in the United States that I might want to learn more about the, the organization. He expressed that um, if, if I were to be uh, initiated, that I would begin to understand the orig origins of Gnosis. Now, I didn't quite understand fully what he uh, meant by that, but... Uh, but he did say Gnosis. He used the term Gnosis. G-N-O-S-S-I-S. -S. That's correct. And, uh, or G-N-O-S-I-S, I'm sorry. G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. By the way, uh, Mr. Cooper, I'm, I uh, am a person with no expertise uh, in uh, these matters. Uh, I, um, I'm, uh, I'm just a, a common person out there like everybody uh, here in this uh, good country and around the rest of the world trying to make a a good honest living, and uh, 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 I, what I'm sharing it was just out of personal interest and was quite a revelation to me personally. I, uh, he then went on to express to me, quote, he, he said as I became initiated, I would more fully understand what he was expressing as time went on. He said it was so important in the, the present world that we return to an understanding of the power latent in our ancient symbols. He went on to say that the power of the ancient craft must soon be revealed to the world, that as I would become initiated, that my eyes would be open to the knowledge of the ancient craft. It was quite unusual. I then expressed what is then the world view of this organization, what they would have to offer. He then began to express that the world had many problems. One was the problem of unequal distribution of wealth. That he thought that it was most crucial that there be a redistribution of wealth throughout the world. And that the only way that this could hopefully be accomplished would be for a world order whereby there would be a global tribunal to execute government. I thought that was most unusual. Uh, then he expressed that um, trouble would soon bring this change about by means of a Machiavellian principle. Again, at this time, he expressed that we must return to an understanding of the power of our ancient symbols. I thought that was most interesting that, that uh, there was a power in the ancient symbols that would uh, have a, an intimate um, play in bringing these changes about. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, he's correct. And the people who've been listening to this broadcast and know exactly what that is. He's talking about the power of the generative force, the phallus, the, the the male principle. But go ahead. He kept repeating that, didn't he? Yes. It, it, was, it was a theme that he repeated over and over again. At this time, then, he expressed that he must make an apology to me, knowing that I was a citizen of the United States. He expressed uh, apologetically that, it was their feeling that America as a national identity would soon experience demise, that the Bill of Rights was much too concrete, 
and at this time expressed that they didn't think well of Jefferson and that uh, the, the uh, Bill of Rights uh, um, was not adequate for stable society. And then what was most unusual, he expressed, quote, in relationship to what we discussed, I, we are very concerned by the emergence of the so-called Minuteman movement in the United States. I, uh, uh, then uh, it was obvious that uh, uh, it was time to, uh, uh, to end our, our meeting. Uh, th there was indeed a large convocation occurring down to the banks of the Thames on Halloween Day. Uh, uh, and uh, I was uh, then um, uh, uh, momentarily uh, terminated in our uh, uh, discussion by two men who came up and expressed in a low tone that Mr. or excuse me, Sir James Lord Goldsmith had just arrived and that he was now going down with the procession to the old ancient temple church. And so that's where I come full circle. The man who owns the uh, primary stock in Newmont Corporation, the primary, one of the primary gold producers in the world, indeed was in attendance with the Freemasons down at the old enclaves of the Knights Templars that very day. Not only that, but appeared to be somebody of uh, quite substantial merit in that order. Interestingly enough, in the National Review, the magazine, the National Review, uh, I think the 23rd of November, there's a, a, uh, an article on Jimmy Goldsmith, uh, and in the last paragraph uh, of that article, in reference to James Goldsmith, it expresses that not only is a person, is he a person of exceptional uh, financial finesse, but is one who should not be underestimated in his political views and his willingness to wield those political views. What I, uh, what this should do uh, is to, ex at least from my uh, experience, uh, witness to the fact that indeed there is a, a consortium of individuals who do have a deep, deeply devout belief in their uh, mystery religion that they do, where possible, impose political and economic pressures on other nations and uh, uh, where possible um, uh, set agendas to fill their world views. I thought it was interesting. Uh, I was able to, uh, subsequent to uh, leaving the uh, uh, lodge, obtain uh, a book from uh, uh, this uh, group and uh, the uh, um, the uh, statements out of this book were most interesting. Um, the, uh, the, the book is entitled Symbolism of the Gods of the Egyptians and the Light They Throw on Freemasonry by Dr. T. N. Stewart. Which, this book was first published in 1927 by Dr. Stewart and was reprinted in 1978 by A. Lewis, Masonic Publishers of London, England. Just a briefly quote from this book. One who would really see Egypt must journey by years and not by miles. He must see with the eye of the mind, the eye of Horus. It is, of course, impossible to assume that the educated classes of Egypt held crude opinions of their symbols in ancient craft. The learned understood the meaning of the symbols and paid their adoration through them to the truth of which they were the coverings. It goes on to express that the sons of light, or those who had become clothed with power and crowned with light, are those who are referred to as, I see the all, I see myself in mind. As many as understood the herald tidings and doused themselves in mind became partakers in the gnosis. And this was in reference to this ancient craft that was, had been referred to me in my meeting at the lodge. And when they had received the mind, they were made perfect men. This is the wisdom religion. 
He who possessed it held it in trust for those who duly and truly were prepared to receive it. And such power can be possessed by no one else than him alone who taketh it. He must wait until he finds the attentive ear to receive the sound from the instructive tongue. Until then, it is safely lodged in the repository of the faithful breast of its custodian. That is the meaning of its secrecy. He goes on, it goes on to, to say then in this book, Symbolism of the Ancient Gods and the Light that it throws on Freemasonry, the learned minority understood the meaning of the symbols as conveying truth beyond the conception of the populace. It goes on to express that first degree mortals are those instructed in a doctrine, but who had not realized the inner vision who lived in worldly things. Then there are those who became creatures of the light, those who have become one with the light of the inner and spiritual world. These later are the sons of light and mind, and in the consciousness self-identity of their own individuality, they had opened the eye of Horus, and the light shineth in the darkness, the inner nature is thus illuminated. The eye of Horus, or all-seeing eye, everyone who has their dollar bill should understand then that the all-seeing eye is not the God that the Christian worship would, the Christian world would worship, but it, according to the ancient mystery religion, as indicated in this book, published by the Masons, is the eye of Horus, which is the inner spiritual vision, a creature of light. No, no more than uh, the being who uh, would perhaps be referred to as an angel of light. And um, I would conclude there, um, it, other than to express that finally I was able to go down to the old uh, um, <clears throat> temple church. I was, went to uh, Westminster Abbey, and a good rector of the Anglican church there was able to direct me to the old ancient church. And if any of you are able, ever able to go to Fleet Street in London, uh, there is a complex referred to as the Old Temple Complex. And there is the Outer Temple, there is the Middle Temple, and towards the very middle is a circular temple from the 10th century built by the Knights Templars themselves. And around this um, complex built by the old Knights Templars and their descendants, are the uh, old buildings uh, that originally housed the Bank of England, the Bank of Scotland, and Lloyd's Bank. And interestingly enough, Goldsmith and his family also has quite a large building just adjacent to the old Knights Templar Church. It is so interesting to see that uh, just uh, a short distance to the uh, south and west along the Thames River, is quite a prominent obelisk. It's known and, and is quite famous as uh, Cleopatra's Needle. And there has uh, the ancient symbols of uh, Egyptian mythology attached to it. Uh, its twin is where? Beg your pardon? Do you know where its twin is? There were originally two. It, I do not know. Other than there, along the Thames, is the ancient uh, obelisk known as Cleopatra's Needle. It's in the other major financial capital of the world. It stands in Central Park in New York City. Is that so? Absolutely. Well, sir, I, I hope that uh, uh, what I've been able to share with you may be enlightening to some, certainly food for thought. And uh, uh, I would like to join with you and the rest of my fellow Americans to say God save this republic. Good evening to you. Thank you very much, Chris, and I'm very sorry about the problems that we had last night. Thank you so much for calling uh, when you heard me ask you to call uh, tonight, and God bless you. Good evening, sir.
my kingdom for an engineer. All these buttons and switches and levels and knobs and faders are making me crazy. Good evening, you're on the air. Yes, Mr. Cooper. Yes. Yes, Mr. Cooper. I have a rotary phone system. I'm trying to get you. I uh, really appreciate what you're doing for the country. I got into you when I first discovered your book. I happened to be being sold by a black Muslim on a black Muslim book part with whales. So that's for them trying to tell you you're a racist. You know. uh, but also, uh, this is Nick from New York. Hello, Nick. Uh, what I'd also like to say is, uh, I haven't heard, uh, sometimes I don't get the heat. Interesting thought about that, seeing the pictures of the derailment. Yeah, there is, there is no update, by the way. They have no leads, no clues, no suspects, no nothing. Dead end. Okay, the thing that I was, I was interested in was, they initially said that they had uh, the bar that connects the uh, tracks. There's four bolts on each side. They took that bar off. They put a longer wire on, and they removed 29 spikes to, you know, move the rail over. And this way, it wouldn't disconnect the current going through the rail. Uh-huh. If they did that, how come the two engines are over? The other side of the trestle still on the tracks. Well, that was a question that I asked right after it happened when I saw the photograph. I don't know. I can't answer that question. Some people say it's because the engine is so heavy and the momentum of the weight of the engine is so much that it carries it through a broken track area and then the cars later that are lighter. Uh, I, I heard that. Uh, but and that doesn't make any sense to me because the engine is pulling those cars. Right. And, you know, if we've ever seen a movie... When they do a derailment, and you know, a real derailment in a movie just for a spectacular, you, you move the rail, the engine goes off, period. It's, it's as simple as that. Also, in the last... Well, be careful now. Don't cite movies, because they do a lot of stunt stuff and things that aren't they, just, that just aren't real. When they do that spectacular, well, it, it takes just a little bit. But the thing was, uh, about a month ago, I worked on Amtrak, and I was looking at engines and the, and the train cars themselves. Now, all of them have brakes, but the engines themselves, they have a, a different type of brake also. It sits over top of the rail and compresses on the rail. Besides, and if you move a rail over just a half an inch, that brake that sits over top of the rail is never going to make it over to the next rail. It's got to derail the engine. Yeah, and you understand because on the uh, a track rail has a lip on the the top of it, and that's for the braking brakes. The engine also has brakes on the wheels, and an also yeah. another brake that p- compresses against the rail itself. Well, I'm not an expert on that stuff. Um, Looking at that, and it's like there's no possible way that that thing could jump over to the next rail, you know. And uh, you know, and then I looked at the pictures again, and. Well, you know what? I'm sorry that people got hurt, and I'm sorry a man died. But, but based upon what's happening in the world and what's going on, I really can't get all worked up about the derailment <laughs> of the train. Oh, no, that was a natural derailment. You know, I, I personally believe it was a natural derailment that they tried to, because the two biggest issues that came out in the first few hours was, you know. Uh, well, what I'm trying to tell you is why are we devoting all this airtime to that? Well, it was just something that I wanted to point out that, you know, there was no way that this thing could have been a derailment and stuff. Uh, you know, a, a domestic terrorist derailment. Is well, I don't think it was a domestic terrorist. It certainly had nothing to do with patriots or the militia. And I worried about you for a minute because the second sentence that came out of their mouth were, in Arizona, is a hotbed of militia activities. And I was wondering <laughs> if it would be cut off or something like that. You know? And I remember there was a little bit of tension in... in certain portions of your, you know, your show the next few days after that. But well, I was angry that they try to pin everything that comes along on patriots. Patriots are what built this country, what has kept this nation free, what has fought the nation's war, what is standing ready now to make sure that people stay free. And the reason they're being attacked is because they want to enslave people, not keep them free. That's what bothered me about it, not the train wreck. Train wrecks happen. Oh, you know. yeah, without a doubt. <clears throat> train wrecks happen. It's, it's, uh, it's sad that they happen. It's sad that people get hurt. I, I really feel terrible about the man who, who lost his life and his family. Can you imagine working 20-some-odd years for the railroad, and all of a sudden <clears throat> you're reaching your retirement age and, and you get snuffed? That's, that's not good. 
But anyway, I don't want to devote any more time to this. We're wasting valuable air time. There's some things I need to talk about. Okay, can I just say one other thing? Quickly. I'm passing the word along to lots of people, and believe it or not, they were very ignorant, just as I am, still to a certain degree, and everybody is learning. <laughs> they really are. Wonderful. Appreciate talking to you. Keep up the good work, and God bless America. Thank you for calling. Good night. Well, folks, they did it to us again. <clears throat> they uh, scammed us. They're sending troops to Bosnia, and they're telling us that it's a NATO exercise. What you don't understand, folks, is NATO is the United Nations. <laughs> You're out there scratching your head saying, what's he talking about? NATO is the United Nations. If you were listening carefully on C-SPAN, you would have picked that up. I'm going to tell you right now. They lied to us. They are lying to us all the time. It is tremendously frustrating. It makes me angry. And it makes me terribly upset that the American people don't even understand what's going on. How they're being fooled. You see this so-called peacekeeping mission to Bosnia? NATO was not set up to keep the peace. That's not the mission of NATO. But the truth is, folks... NATO is the United Nations. You see, <laughs> let me sort of set you straight here, if I can. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization charter that created NATO was created under the auspices of the United Nations Charter. You see, NATO is a regional organization controlled by the United Nations. Now, if you don't believe that, get the tape of General John Nazi Crashwilly, or Shali Kashvili. Doesn't matter how you say it, it means the same said this on the 30th of November before a House committee hearing. It was on C-SPAN. He is the chairman of the United States Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he explained to that committee on C-SPAN that before troops are deployed by NATO, the United Nations Security Council must pass an activating resolution. You see, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, is a subset of the United Nations. It was formed under the auspices of the United Nations Charter. It is a political and economic as well as a military organization. NATO, ladies and gentlemen, was intended as... I have to stop and take a deep breath. Was intended at its inception to be the enforcement arm of the United Nations. And it's written in the documents. You see, the American people would never accept a world government, would not give up their sovereignty back in those days. So they nibbled at us, and they created a regional organization rather than a world organization. <clears throat> it is called NATO. And I've already told you that they're Sending a lot more. They said 20,000. Now we've heard that there's 17,000 on top of that 27,000, which, excuse me, 20,000, which makes 37,000. And they're saying that that's to back up the 20,000. If you understand military logistics, you know that that's a lot because it takes four backup support personnel for every one combat soldier in the field. That's a rule. And as far as I know, it's never changed. It's a charade. It's a lie. And you need to call, and you need to write senators, representatives, governors, the president, the Pentagon, everybody, and tell them you don't appreciate this. You're not going to go for it. You're not going to support it. And don't buy this bullshit about supporting our boys. Don't buy it for a second. Wrong is wrong. You see, 
they get into this political debate about whether they should go or not. And they say, screw you, we don't care what you think, we're going to send them no matter what. And all America is against this. So they throw it in our face, they send them, then they turn around and say, well, don't take it out on the poor soldier. You must support our boys, which means support the mission, which means support sending troops to Bosnia, which means if we do it, we're just a bunch of fools. And which means, if you do it, they're going to stay there, and they're going to get killed, and they're going to die, and they're going to come home in body bags. Is that what you want? We have no interest there whatsoever. And I don't care what the rest of the world thinks about us. We're saving the lives of our young men and women and not sending them anywhere unless it's absolutely, 100% in the interest of the nation, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the sovereignty of this country. They want a new world order. All these other nations of the world have the opportunity to apply for state citizenship under the United States of America, and if they choose not to, then they make their own bed. And as far as I'm concerned, they should lie in it. Because this just makes me sick. You see, I was a fool for a good portion of my life. I went and fought Vietnam for something that had nothing to do with the United States. It had to do with oil in the Gulf of Tonkin and the South China Sea. And heroin in the Golden Triangle. We had no interest whatsoever in South Vietnam or North Vietnam or anywhere. And quite frankly... I didn't buy the domino theory then, and I don't buy it now. And from all the research that I've done, it was all a bunch of crap anyway. Good evening. You're on the air. Hello. Uh, I wanted to ask, does the United States government act in uh, is it fiduciary, fiduciary role for me uh, in the, somewhere in the internal revenue tax code? And what are you talking about? Oh, I'm here talking about sending our young men and women to die in Bosnia. I'm sorry, I didn't know. I'm sorry. Aren't you listening to your radio? I, I just walked in the door. I had been working today. And I just turned it on and I heard uh, there being some call-ins. So I'm sorry. Well, there hasn't been a call-in for quite a while. And since that call-in, I've been talking specifically about Bosnia. But please call back on another night when we're talking about those subjects or when we have open subject night, okay? I'm sorry. That's all right. All right, Chihuahua. Sometimes I think I'm beating my head against the brick wall. It's like, uh, <laughs> is anybody out there listening? Does anybody care? I mean, really. Have you ever read the letter? that Bill Clinton sent thanking his benefactor for getting him out of the draft while he was making a trip to be indoctrinated into the Marxist socialist principles of governing masses of sheeple in Moscow and organizing protests against the United States government in Europe? Did you ever read it? And here, this, this little wimp is sending our boys and girls to die in the country has nothing to do with us whatsoever. It's all about world government, folks. If you don't understand that by now, you're going to get a stiff dose of it, and you're not going to like it. Good evening. You're on the air. Hi, Bill. Uh, Gary from Connecticut. Um, you're dead on the short way, but um, I'm calling in anyway. I don't know if the satellite guys are good, but you went out about 30 minutes ago. I'm sorry about the... Uh Three minutes ago. Three minutes ago? Yeah, or so, yeah. Well, I must be off of the satellite, so I'll try it. I'll just keep talking if I please. Okay, keep on talking. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, uh, um, Bosnia thing. Um, it's just, you know, sad. We're going to get wiped. You know, we're going to get creamed. And the problem is, 
I mean, you know, I remember what it was like when I was 18, and you do too, and, you know, I mean, we were just poisoned by testosterone. But somehow we should have known better, you know, I mean, as responsible adults. And these, these guys over there, I guess, you know, I'm 37 now, and, you know, you fought a war, I didn't, but... Check and see if we're on the short wave now, would you? Give me a well, let me get... While I play some music. Hey, you're up. Are we on? You got it. Okay. Turn your radio off. Okay, you're up. Well, um, Looks like, you know, whenever I'm right on the money, whenever I'm telling the truth and hurting them hard, yeah, that's, I know. It's, that's when they pull the switch on the transponder on the satellite and dump me off the air. Oh, um, last night was just uh, the, one of the best in a, in a while. I mean, you just wrapped that whole thing into a nice little package. That's well, just, just about the most complete hour you've ever I've heard you do. Well, tonight I'm sticking it to Nazi Crash Willie and uh, the draft dodger in the White House who uh, <laughs> doesn't inhale. Over there, it's just terrible. It's just terrible, and I'm just shocked by this. I mean, you know, I have no military knowledge, but uh, so you're talking 20,000 plus uh, another, what, four, uh, six, uh, It takes four support personnel for every one man in a combat field. Oh, there was another 80,000. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely correct. More and gals. Wow. Hey, can I ask you a quick question about the Kennedy thing, and then and, and I'll let you go? No, let's stick to this. Why don't you wait for another night? Thanks for calling, and thanks for helping out on that dump. Okay. Good night. Thank you. 520-333-4578 is the number. If you'd like to call and talk about this Bosnia fiasco, is your brother or sister, uncle, aunt, father or mother going to come back in a body bag? Good evening. You're on the air. Hi, uh, Bill. I'm calling from Orlando, California. I need you to put your mouth in front of your mouthpiece and talk up. Is that better? That's much better. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm a sound engineer calling to offer my services. <laughs> uh, I'd like to send you my name and number and so forth. Well, why don't you call me during the day or fax me? This is the fax number also. Folks, I'm trying to talk about Bosnia. I'm trying to talk about our men and women being sent over there to die. Now, if nobody cares, I'll pull the plug on this program and go to bed. Good evening. You're on the air. Uh, hi, Bill. It's Greg from Alamogordo. Hello, Greg. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, regarding Bosnia... Um, obviously, I feel much the same as you do, but I also had a question that probably you can help me with. In the different magazine articles, pictures, TV, video that I've seen from Bosnia, especially of the Serbs, I see a lot of, uh, like I recall one officer who on his hat had just sort of a, a double eagle looking like it had the luminous triangle over it. <laughs> also, I've seen a black flag that had the white and crossbones over it. Sure. And I was wondering... Um, this whole thing is an Illuminati war. It's designed to make people call for the end of war, which means the end of nation states. Of course, there's, there comes your uh, uh, racial cleansing and your rape chants, right? Well, I also have another question. Uh, now, this is um, the history of, of, of Yugoslavia going back. Would I be right in thinking I, I know something about the... Uh, like the Albigensian Crusade and, and some of the Cathars back there. Is that in the same general area? Uh, uh, would I be right in thinking that the Bogomils a long time ago were in the same area where now these same Serb guys are wearing the same sort of symbolism? That yes, yes. And those movements were luminous movements. I thought. Yeah, you know, as far as the uh, uh, troops going there, you know, I, 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 I don't know what to say. I, I told... I'm sure you go through the same thing all the time. I know you do. I've told people a year and a half ago, and I didn't even know what I knew now. I was telling people, you watch. If Bosnia is on the news, we're going there. Yeah, I said it when it first started, when it first flared up, that we would definitely, without any doubt whatsoever, send troops to Bosnia as a part of the cementing of the power of the United Nations and the New World Order. And, and I, I, I especially pointed out to people, I said, look at the way they publicize However terrible it might be over there with the rape camps, etc., uh, look how they publicize that and with a plea that something's got to be done, something's got to be done. 
you know, and I, 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 I love the thought that we can never let it, that we should never let it happening again, but I don't know about taking that word we and applying it to me, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, you, you wouldn't have much choice if they tapped on your door and said, you're going, would you? No, I guess not. <laughs> no, but then you'd have to make up your mind, wouldn't you? Yeah. What I'm saying is it could happen to anybody. Yeah. And everybody's going to slough it off until it's one of their relatives that comes back dead, and then all of a sudden they're going to wish they'd done something. Yeah, well, that's just like... And I'm going to tell you something else. This could erupt into a major war, like a World War Three. Well, what did they say? I, I've heard many people say that nothing that ever starts in the Balkans finishes there. Nothing ever has finished that started in the Balkans. Did you know that World War One started in Sarajevo when the Archduke was assassinated? Yeah, in fact, I, I actually I read something about that right around when I first started hearing about Bosnia. Uh, in fact, Newsweek of all magazines might have actually mentioned that, and uh, I think I remember hearing about that. But you know, my my uh, as far as my studying of history, I kind of have a gap around where World War One is. I have to admit that. But uh, yeah, a lot of I, I can see the trends going through, and and it does not surprise me that. We're going over there again. And and with what you're saying about NATO and the U.N. being one and the same. Don't believe me. Get the North Atlantic Treaty Organization's charter and the treaty and the documents that went along with it and research the newspaper articles when this was all being formed and you'll see that it was under the auspices of the United Nations. General Shali Kashvili was telling the truth. They can't do anything over there until the Security Council of the United Nations passes a resolution, which had to have already happened or they wouldn't be going. Well, wasn't that the same? Uh, I mean, I assume the Warsaw Pact was under the same auspices. Would it not be? Absolutely. Well, now you're, now you're showing signs of brilliance, my friend. Well, Absolutely. I, well, uh, what I'm saying is, is if, if I buy the, the premise, well, if I buy the truth that the uh, Cold War is, is a cold ham, then obviously it would seem to me the Warsaw Pact would have to be in there. Cause Absolutely. If they were all members of the United Nations and they came under the Warsaw Pact, it's the counterweight to NATO, and uh, it's also under the auspices of the United Nations Charter. Yeah, they have to be on both sides of, of every single issue. And, uh, you know, you're, you're uh, absolutely right as far as... Uh, uh, well, what I was going to say about that NATO and the UN was just today I was talking to a guy uh, at work, and I t and he says, well, you know, he he kind of has he kind of has similar feelings about the UN. I think he feels something ominous there, but somehow the idea of NATO was enough to sort of pacify him. Well, that's the... don't be fooled. I said, don't be fooled. It's they just switch their hats. You know, they wear a blue helmet, or we don't like the blue helmet, or put on our regular helmet. You know. That's right. That's exactly what has happened. And when the American people were raising holy hell about our troops serving under the United Nations uh, command and wearing United Nations uniforms, and Specialist News stood up and said he wasn't going to do it, uh, and we did a headline article in our newspaper, they just took off the UN blue helmet, put on NATO, which is still United Nations, and everybody said, oh, that's nice. Uh, you know, it's okay if they die under NATO, but we don't want them to die under UN. We just want them to die. <laughs> yeah, that's another, that's, another, that's another bone of contention I have is the way they were talking about acceptable losses over there as if one is, is acceptable at all, you know? There are no acceptable casualties in a country that we have nothing to do with, no interest in, and uh, uh, if they were to fight for the next 5,000 years, it wouldn't have one single iota of a ripple in this country whatsoever period. Yep. But what gets me is the American people's hypocrisy. Well, it's uh, it's, it's pablum, isn't it? It's okay, son. You go over there and die. You know, you'll be wearing a NATO hat, so it's okay. What? You're <laughs> not stupid! Well, you're not, if you, and the, the, the kicker is, if you, if you decide you're not going to go over there, well, then you're not a patriot. I, I like that. I like how they, whenever they need to use the word patriot, oh, they use it. Oh, yeah. And whenever they don't need it, they will demonize it like anything. Yeah. It, it sickens me. It sickens me. And, you know, I, I hate to say it. I'm 25 years old, and, and I see um, most, just about everyone around me who's, you know, twice and three times my age, and I look at them and I think, you know, <laughs> you know, take the <laughs> take the wool off your eyes, you know. It's it's pretty interesting. Well, Bill, I, I've kind of got to go. I'm looking at the clock, and it looks like you're Okay. I want to let get somebody else in here before we leave. Okay. Well, thanks again, and uh, have a good night. Thank you for calling. Brilliant, brilliant caller. Good thinking. 
520-333-4578. Good evening. You're on the air. Uh, this is Jeffrey from New Orleans. Hello, Jeffrey. Hi. I've, I've done all the things you asked, including calling the senators and the congressmen and the president, etc. I wanted to tell you that I'm sending in the mail, I sent it last Saturday, the documentation I got from Senator John Bro on the Michael News situation. Uh, summarizing it, basically, the government is claiming that under Article 5 of the UN Charter and under Article 1, Section 5 Constitution, the President has the authority to do what he's doing. Of course, it's all a bunch of baloney. It's, it's a lie. He has no authority whatsoever to do what he's doing. Yeah, that's correct. It's a lie, but that's what they're claiming, that, that therefore the law that, was, that Michael knew refused to obey is a lawful order and therefore knew he was going to be court-martialed uh, either December or January. Yes. On the Bosnian thing, my suspicion is that uh, the reason we're over there is to get us used to fighting alongside the Soviets so that someday, in the not too distant future, they may turn that army on us, and they're preparing to use it on us to fight us. Well, I guarantee you that's in the cards uh, at some point along the way. And not only that, but I think that um, one of the, the other part of it has to do with the... Um, Oh, the old club of wrong agenda where they want to keep down the population, etc. If they can't do it with the birth control, they'll do it through the, uh, through the use of war. And of course, the big resistors to birth control and abortion are the Muslims. They're, they were the ones who fought it in Cairo, etc., etc., at the conferences. So, I'm, I'm, of course, I know that this is the wrong fight, wrong place, wrong time, and, and that's what we've got to do is to, um, alert the American folks, and that's what I've been doing. Great. Thank you, Jeffrey. I'm out of time. Thank you for calling. And uh, if that isn't enough, folks, guess who Clinton wants to make chief of NATO? He wants the next Secretary General of NATO to be Spain's Foreign Minister, Javier Solano Madariaga. He is an anti-NATO Spaniard who heads up the Socialist Workers' Party in Spain. Comrade Clinton, ladies and gentlemen, is behaving absolutely true to form. He is a dyed-in-the-wool Marxist, socialist, and as far as I'm concerned, he's committing treason. Good night, and God bless you all.